This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Tonight, disconnected. Halifax cuts power to those who remain at the tent encampments in Grand Parade and Sackville. Remembering Brian Mulroney, the former Prime Minister has died at the age of 84. And a new plate special. Meet the Halifax chef paying tribute to his childhood memories of Germany. A brisk and blustery start to March, but temperatures rising nicely overnight and into the weekend. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. The power was cut off at two Halifax tent encampments today. The city gave notice two days ago that it would take this step as part of an ongoing effort to clear out some of the city's biggest encampments. People are slowly moving out of those locations, but as Taryn Grant reports, they are not necessarily moving indoors. Just after 9 o'clock this morning, city staff pulled the plug on the tents in Grand Parade. They also dropped off a dumpster to help with cleanup. So far, no one is being forcibly removed. The city says it's taking a measured approach in the hopes that people will leave of their own accord. Because they can't stay in the encampments. Those designated sites are de-designated now and those parks are closed and people do need to move on. Nova Scotia's Community Services Minister says he wants people to move into shelters so they can connect more easily with workers in his department. We, we just can't treat every individual with the same plan. We want to have individualized human approach to these things. So we want to get people into a warm, safe place and then start working with them to have medium and long-term housing solutions. But not everyone wants to live in a shelter, even if it's just for a short time. In that case, they're being told to simply move to other encampments. If they want electricity, they can go to a green space off Barrington Street near the McDonald Bridge. So again, if somebody's has decided, you know, I'm not going inside. I, I, my choice is to stay out. There's a location that we're telling people has power. And if that's important, there's an option for you. There are a handful of encampments that are still approved by the city, but people will not be able to stay at those sites indefinitely. The municipality's goal long term is no encampments. We don't want anybody to, to that to be their option. The city plans to issue a request for proposals next week for some form of emergency housing to help get more people inside. Taryn Grant, CBC News, Halifax. The last of 26 charges laid after the 2021 Halifax housing protest has ended with an acquittal. This week, 44-year-old Amanda Reckonick was not guilty of obstructing a police officer. The decision caps a two-and-a-half-year legal saga during which just a handful of prosecutions proceeded. The majority of the 26 charges the police laid were dropped. Of the seven that proceeded, there were two acquittals and five convictions that resulted in probationary sentences. The demonstration saw hundreds of people gathered to oppose the removal of small shelters by city workers. A Halifax nonprofit says 10 families are out of their homes tonight after being evicted or having their fixed term leases come to an end. A spokeswoman for ADSIM for Women and Children says about 25 children are impacted and the group has been fielding calls all week from worried parents. You know, it's, they don't have a lot of options. Most of the families are, you know, some are unfortunately being forced to sleep in their cars. Some might have found a temporarily stay with family or friends, but, you know, th their situation really hasn't dramatically changed since earlier in the week. They are still homeless. And I'll talk to Sarah Carrier with Adsum for Women and Children about the impact fixed-term leases are having on the housing situation in the city. That's our newsmaker just after 6.30. Opposition MLAs are criticizing the government for not giving the Auditor General the full budget increase she requested. Kim Adair wanted an additional $1.1 million so she could hire three more staff, short-term experts and increase wages in her office as part of a growing mandate to look at the province's health care system. The budget tabled by the government on Thursday increased funding for Adair's office by $200,000. Both the Liberals and NDP say the government should have provided a full request. In a statement, Adair says she is pleased with the increase and that it will allow her to add two people to the health audit team. One of Canada's most consequential leaders is being remembered. 
Former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney died yesterday at the age of 84. Mulroney had been recovering last year from a heart procedure and treatment for prostate cancer. A statement from his daughter says he died peacefully surrounded by his family. Mulroney has deep ties to this province. He entered the House of Commons after winning a by-election in the former federal riding of Central Nova in August of 1983. He was also a graduate of St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish. That's where he led a massive fundraising effort to launch the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government. The CBC's at Rafi Buji Canyon has more reaction on the death of Canada's 18th Prime Minister. All over Parliament Hill, where Brian Mulroney called home for years, signs a nation is in mourning. He changed this, can this country. I mean, he was a transformative prime minister. We've not had many of those. Rick Perkins saw this firsthand as a staffer in Mulroney's government. The big issues that he tackled are still in place today, whether it's NAFTA, free trade, uh, the things that he did on the world stage we all know about from apartheid and bringing the Commonwealth and Francophonie along uh, to support uh, his fight to free Nelson Mandela and end apartheid. But in his last days, Mulroney was away from the limelight. Brian had a fall and um, I had to go to the hospital and uh, passed away yesterday, uh, late in the afternoon. So uh, the wonderful thing is that all four of the children were able to be here uh, in time to see their father. Mulroney continued to be honoured on the hill today, with a book of condolences placed by his portrait as tributes poured in from opposition and government. Well, there's certainly going to be uh, many examples of disagreements that many New Democrats had with some of the policies. But today is the day to reflect on, on his contributions. And uh, I, can, I can say with a lot of confidence, he did have uh, significant contributions to Canada. And there are things that we can agree with. His work on environmentalism, his work on fighting apartheid in South Africa. The idea of service and devotion to country uh, ran through everything he did. And I think in this time of uh, a level of toxicity and personal attacks in politics that seems to have gotten uh, worse uh, over the past while, uh, I think it's important to inspire ourselves and to take a moment to remember uh, that everyone who serves does so out of a deep and abiding love for Canada. The Prime Minister announced today Canadians will have their own opportunity to publicly mourn Mulroney and the government is working with the family to arrange a state funeral soon. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. All right, Ryan, the first day of March is here. I don't know if it's entering like a lion, but it's, <laughs> it's awfully chilly. It's definitely cold. Uh, it's a lamb, but it's a cold lamb. Uh, that is for sure, Amy. Uh, thank you so much as we look at those temperatures out there. Yeah, it really didn't warm up today as advertised. Uh, minus three to, well, minus two there, back row, but for the most part, we're in that minus three to minus six or seven range across the mainland, though minus eight to Anaganish, and yeah, minus nine to 10 across Cape Breton right now. Uh, that cold air in place, thanks to those westerly winds, which are adding to the bite to the air with a pretty wicked wind chill, especially this morning. Uh, this is the next low that's coming in, although before it gets here, this area of high pressure is going to continue to dominate and we're going to get into that southwest flow. That's going to bump temperatures up. And so we're looking mild for the weekend, much more uh, spring like. And you can see uh, four or five degrees across Cape Breton tomorrow. Most of the mainland is going to be in the five, six, seven, eight, and nine degree range. So mid to high single digits. We're gonna hang on to the mild weather for Sunday, but we will add in the showers and the cloud cover. And that will begin in fact, as early as Saturday evening in through the Southwest. As we look at the timeline of this, there's that high sliding off. There's the building clouds through Saturday afternoon. Showers marching in Saturday evening into the overnight, and then uh, those showers will continue into Sunday as that low is spinning just off to our south. Uh, those showers drizzle, fog patches are going to be remaining in the mix as well uh, with that southerly flow. That low will kind of slide off to the east, and this area of high pressure will bring in uh, at least somewhat drier weather as we turn the page into early next week, Amy. But it does look like the clouds will generally dominate, but the temps will stay mild through much of next week. We'll explain with your seven-day forecast coming up. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you.
Ottawa is streamlining its rules for tidal power development in the Bay of Fundy as it looks for better ways to measure the environmental impacts of turbine blades spinning underwater. It's one of the responses announced this week after the only tidal producer pulled out of Nova Scotia in frustration. Paul Withers reports. Three companies have been chosen by the province. Harnessing this unique resource allows us to build. We will be investing $4.2 million. Over the years, there have been plenty of announcements promoting tidal power, but there's been precious little success. Two turbines were installed at the test site in the Minas Passage. One was destroyed within days. The other also failed and remains on the ocean floor. Today, no electricity is being generated from the tides. The owner of the last tidal platform to produce electricity abandoned the province. It was our inability to... Uh get an authorization from uh, DFO that would enable us to build our flagship demonstration project. Jason Heyman's company, Sustainable Marine, installed its tidal platform near Briar Island where it performed well, hailed of course by politicians. A great announcement from Sustainable Marine for the first time has actually got uh, in-stream tidal energy generated in the Bay of Fundy. But the company was never able to secure federal approval for the next step, installing multiple platforms in the Minas Passage. The embarrassment over the company's departure triggered a task force review and changes this week designed to create a pathway for developers. DFO has adopted a 15-year project approval that allows multiple turbines provided it can demonstrate no adverse effects. Previously, each device required a separate authorization. That gives a little bit more certainty to the industry who has to plan investments and the logistics around these devices uh, while also upholding our requirements as a regulator around the Fisheries Act and the Species at Risk Act. Acadia University and the agency that manages the tidal testing area will look for better ways to determine the collision risk between fish and turbine blades, the big challenge in the murky, fast-flowing waters. It's really aimed at uh, moving towards a field program where we can test different technologies and sensors and combinations of sensors to understand uh, what the true capabilities are for monitoring in the Minas Passage. It's a, a very small nudge of the needle. Jason Heyman remains skeptical. And they're not able to articulate what form of mitigations or monitoring they're expecting to see, um, or that these are even possible. In the meantime, another small-scale tidal turbine installation is planned later this month, not far from where the sustainable marine platform broke loose and ran aground after the company declared bankruptcy. Paul Withers, CBC News, Halifax. Organizations or businesses interested in building small-scale solar farms and selling the electricity can now apply to get help from the provincial government. The province has officially launched its community solar program. In this year's budget, there's a total of just over $5 million available to those willing to build the solar gardens. Those who buy the power will get a solar energy credit of $0.02 cents per kilowatt an hour on their power bill. The province's climate change strategy has set a target of at least 500 megawatts of new local renewable energy by 2026. Well, it was a golden throw for Queen's County's Sarah Mitten at the World Athletics Indoor Championships in Glasgow, Scotland this morning. That was the moment Mitten became world shot put champion. The 27-year-old from Brooklyn, Nova Scotia, broke a Canadian record twice on her way to gold. Mitten also won the event with a new national indoor record throw of 20.22 metres. She set the mark with her final attempt, having already wrapped up the gold medal with a mark of 20.20 metres in her fourth throw. I, I still think it's settling in, but I am so excited. You know, I've been in second and third a lot, and I'm just really excited to kind of come out on top and start my year off really strong headed into Paris. And, of course, that means Sarah Mitten will arrive at this summer's Paris Olympic Games as a world champion. Well, Chef Ian Clark's love of German food goes back to his early childhood. He was born and raised in Lahr, Germany, where his military parents were stationed, living in private married quarters housing known as PMQs. And these days, he runs a restaurant in Halifax, where he's creating dishes inspired by the meals his mom used to make. German cooking has really, like, merged into the mainstream completely. It's there. It's all around everyone all the time, but you don't notice it.
Let's talk about the name. How did you come up with PMQ? PMQ were housing that the Canadian military would build for soldiers and their families. And when I decided I wanted to build a German restaurant here, kind of reflecting on my connection to Germany as being a military brat who lived in the Lahr Canadian military bases there and living in a PMQ housing. To me, it represented this act of intentional home, family, and community building, and I just felt that's exactly what I want to do. Well, let's head over to the kitchen, All see right. what's cooking. So who are your customers? Who comes in here? We have a variety of people who come in here. We definitely get um, people who know German cooking or are themselves German. We also get a lot of people who they hear about my story and they themselves often lived in or were born or grew up in Lahr as part of the Canadians over there. Um, and they usually want to talk to me. They're like, hi, <laughs> I also was in Lahr. And then I think it's just people who are curious to try something different. We definitely do get customers and they see our menu and they're just like, I don't know what a lot of this stuff is. And so our servers have to do a lot of double work explaining right. various dishes to people. Pretzels and schnitzels are the one thing that people usually are like, okay, that I get. I know what a pretzel is. I'm going to get that. I know how delicious those can taste. Is there a certain knack to doing this? Doing it a lot? Yeah, right. Over Practice and over and over perfect. again. Uh, how many do you think you've made? <laughs> it's got to be a few thousand at this yeah. point. So We're going to stick it into our simmering pot in the back. And that is water with a little bit of baking soda and salt in it. The point is that you'll have that chemical reaction to the exterior of the bread. And that's really what makes it smell and taste pretzely. Otherwise, it just tastes like baked bread. Now, yeah. your mom's had a big influence on you, though, right, in terms of, of what you made. Yeah. You know, I was the firstborn child. She had been in the military herself previous to that. And I think she very much sort of like stranded in a foreign country with a new baby. And she just sort of like leaned a lot into the place that we, she was at and she picked up a lot of recipes. And so even though we moved away when I was five, we still were eating the schnitzels and the spatzels and all the good things that she had picked up there and brought back here to Canada with her. What are you seeing with the food scene even since you've come back to the city and grown up in the city? Have you seen many changes? Yeah, I've lived in Halifax on and off since I was 12 years old. And I think it's, you know, phenomenal in the ways. It's like as much as I love chowder and fish cakes, it's, it's nice to see other things suddenly becoming possible. We have the whole world coming here to Nova Scotia. And it makes Nova Scotia a much richer place for having all that here. So in the much the same way that Germans once influenced and became part of what it is to have Nova Scotia cuisine, it's now we have so many more new people also doing the exact same thing. And we are all the richer and better for it. So now we've got the finished product. Yeah. What do you start with? People usually eat our pretzel as okay. their appetizer. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Pretzel cheer. Uh -huh. mm. Now what is that? That's maple butter. Also just sort of slather it on? Just slather it on, yeah. Go right ahead. We do the maple butter. Usually in Germany it would be honey butter, but maple butter seems slightly more Little Canadian. Little nod to Nova Scotia? Yeah. All right, I'm wearing white, so this could be dangerous. <laughs> All right, dig All right, in. Dig in. Mmm, so good. So tender. And a really good mushroom flavor, too. That's fresh pasta for you. Well, this has like been a little visit to Germany. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. Coming up, some experts are concerned about what artificial intelligence could mean for the justice system. Alexei Navalny's parents and supporters gather in Moscow as the Russian opposition leader is laid to rest. And we've got Ryan up next with his full weather forecast. We'll see you in just a few minutes.
Okay, so very frosty today, yep. but the weekend has got a warm-up coming, right? It's looking very spring-like, which is fitting for the start of meteorological spring, mm -hmm. Amy. Listen, I know we're going to get some flack for this. Everybody loves astronomical spring. The traditional spring, of course, doesn't begin for 20 days, but... I'm going to make the case now, I'm going to make the argument that spring really begins March 1st when you look at, again, climatologically, the statistics show we're already on the rise temperature wise, uh, I'll take right? it, you know, any, any chance to get more spring. Right? Yeah. Yes. And one, our temperatures are already trending up and two, the days are getting longer and three, uh, in terms of, you know, statistics and data, it's just so much easier to keep track of things when you look at the civic calendar. Mm -hmm. The months mm -hmm. of March, April and May, boom, spring, June, July, August. And yeah, then we, of course, start ticking down in September. So 
Meteorological versus astronomical seasons. There you go. That's you stirred up a debate. One on one. Oh, no doubt. No <laughs> doubt. Now, I got a web story coming up on this uh, tomorrow morning that's going to be launched, and I'm guessing the comment section will be fiery. Uh, have a look at uh, temperatures that uh, you can see right now. Yeah, it is not feeling like spring out there right now. Uh, very cold start indeed to March and to meteorological spring. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's just temperature wise. Then you factor in the winds. Uh, we've got uh, sustained 30, 40 kilometers per hour. And yes, uh, some gusts still in the 50 kilometer per hour range. And yes, even stronger than that as we look into places like Grand Etang. And also, of course, uh, uh, Digby Neck area. Now, as we look at the wind chills, uh, feeling minus double digits and into the minus teens here across the north and east, uh, it is certainly uh, quite chilly indeed. Now, as we look at the satellite radar picture, area of high pressure dominating, there's our cold front that raced through here yesterday, and that is now pushing out across the North Atlantic. But uh, warm front building in uh, across the Great Lakes right now, temperatures warming up quite nicely already on the other side of this frontal boundary. And this is the system that's going to kind of work its way up the coast as we move through the next couple of days. And that will increase our clouds, bring us a chance for showers and uh, will be keeping us unsettled. Temperatures up to eight degrees in Toronto. Thunder Bay is up to eight as well. Minneapolis up to 14. And so you can see where that warmer air is creeping up here. Just five in Atlanta. So yeah, it's a little uh, Topsy-turvy for sure in terms of the weather out there across North America right now. Minus 12 to minus 15 Calgary to Edmonton. Okay, so the winds are going to become light tonight. They will tick down as we work our way through tonight. Uh, we'll see uh, uh, those lows right near the, I should say, temperatures rising in Yarmouth. That's why you're seeing the one there. Uh, across the rest of the mainland, temperatures are going to be uh, likely, yeah, well, let's show you the timeline. This is the easiest way to explain it. Watch as we move through the next couple of hours. Temperatures ticking up in Yarmouth will actually tick down in the Halifax and eastern areas uh, by the time we get to the early overnight, but then starting to rise up early morning for Halifax. You folks in Cape Breton, your overnight lows will be your traditional early morning temperatures for tomorrow. But yeah, by 8 a.m. tomorrow, we've already bumped up to the two to four range in through the southwest. So again, a little different in terms of uh, nighttime temperatures, depending on where you are across the province. And it's because this southwest flow is on the increase, bumping those temperatures up throughout the overnight. And for tomorrow afternoon, certainly the clouds increasing, but those temperatures are going to be quite lovely. Five to eight degrees or four to eight degrees across Cape Breton tomorrow. Uh, we'll likely hit seven, eight and nine degrees for the Northumberland and Eastern Shore regions tomorrow. Eight, nine degrees. Wouldn't be surprised if we hit some double digits thanks to that afternoon sunshine in the Annapolis Valley. Kedgy also a good chance of cracking nine. Bridgewater near nine, but Lunenburg likely four or five. Similar story in the Halifax area. If you're right along the coast, four or five degrees. The water temperature is two. That's going to have an influence inland seven or eight degrees. We're mild on Sunday as well. Seven, eight, nine, ten degrees. And you can see that those showers are going to be persistent. Certainly Sunday morning looks like we may dry out a little bit late day. This system slides off to the east. High pressure moves in but we will be still remaining with some isolated showers uh, for Monday. We should be around one this time of year. We are going to be far exceeding that right through the first week of March, keeping an eye on a late week system that may bring some at least a wintry mix into the uh, into the mix for late week. But as I will show you again in that web story launching tomorrow morning at CBC.ca slash Nova Scotia, even the second week of March is looking like it's quite likely to be well above seasonal. Amy. All right. Well, spring has sprung then. Yeah, I, I'm saying it. <laughs> you sure are. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Well, artificial intelligence can be a useful tool. In just a few seconds, it can perform tasks that would normally take a lawyer hours or even days. But courts across the country are issuing warnings about it, and some experts say the very integrity of the justice system is at stake. Allie Thompson explains. In a courtroom, language is everything. Lawyers make arguments, judges deliver rulings. But what happens when those words were put together by a computer? Lawyers are using artificial intelligence, so what's at stake? Some say the very integrity of the justice system. Here's the answer that it gave me in probably took one second. Jonathan Samier works with the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, the group that regulates the industry. As he types a question into ChatGPT, it spits out an answer within seconds. 
It's an AI tool he and other lawyers are using to do things like manage their calendars, help them create contracts, and do legal research. What normally takes lawyers hours or even days, the AI can do in seconds. But accuracy is a chief concern. Samye always checks the AI's work, a crucial step for any lawyer using AI. That's wrong. That used it used to be six years. It's now two years. Okay. Wow. So here's a prime example of we're just not there yet in terms of accuracy when it comes to those systems. Samye says these inaccuracies are sometimes referred to as hallucinations, and those can have a chilling effect. It obviously can put the, the integrity of the entire system in jeopardy uh, if all of a sudden we start introducing information that's simply inaccurate uh, into things that become precedent, that become reference, that become local authority. So ChatGPT can be flat out wrong, and that has to do with how it works. ChatGPT is one of many AI tools anyone can access online through a public terminal. It's a language model, meaning it's just looking for the next best word in a sequence, based on what you've asked it to do. And experts say that can give lawyers a false sense of security. Ever since the beginning of time, language has only emanated from other people. And so we give it a sense of trust that perhaps we shouldn't, right? We anthropomorphize these types of systems where we impart human qualities to them and we think that they are being um, more human than they actually are. That's exactly what happened in a courtroom last year in New York. Two lawyers submitted a legal brief that included six fictitious case citations, which were completely made up by ChatGPT. That case was concerning to Sanjay Khanna at Cox and Palmer. Lawyers at that firm are not using AI, yet. They're worried about putting private or privileged information into an open source system that anyone can access. It's one of those situations where you don't want to put the cart before the horse. And uh, in my experiences, a lot of organizations start to get excited and follow those flashing lights and implement tools without, per without properly vetting them out in the sense of, how the data can be used, where the data is being stored, is it in-house, on-prem, on-premise, within servers internally, or is it cloud-based, which, uh, again, uh, where is that data being housed? So some lawyers are using AI and others aren't, but should they be using it? When asked that question, Katie Selegi didn't mince words. Oh, absolutely not. Not right now, that's for sure. Um, I don't think that anybody should be using generative AI to do anything other than, you know, party tricks. I think there are a couple of problems. One is that I think it is a problem for human dignity. So if we have an idea of having humanity as a value at the center of our judicial system, that that can be eroded if we outsource too much of the decision-making power to non-human entities. Um, I think that it might be problematic for the rule of law as an organizing force for our society if we, um, if we don't have confidence and if we don't believe right, that the law is working for us more or less most of the time and that we have the capability to participate it and change it, it, it risks converting the rule of law into a rule by law. There's something a little bit authoritative or authoritarian about what law might look like in a world that is controlled by, um, by robots and machines. Right now, AI in law is a wild west. Courts across the country have issued notices and guidelines about it, but there's no real regulation on how the technology should be used. The Nova Scotia Barrister Society is revamping its set of law office standards to include AI and has created a guide. But for now, it's up to lawyers to decide whether a computer can help them uphold the law. Ali Thompson, CBC News, Supreme Court in Halifax. Up next, I'll talk with Sarah Carrier with Adsum for Women and Children, and I'll ask about the 10 families who just became homeless, many as a result of fixed-term leases. That's our newsmaker. Stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News.
A Halifax nonprofit says it has received anxious calls from 10 families with a total of 25 children who are facing eviction or the end of a fixed lease as, the, as of yesterday. ADSIM for Women and Children operates two emergency shelters and supportive housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality. Sarah Carrier is with ADSIM for Women and Children. So what is happening with these families now that it is the 1st of March? Well, um, you know, it's, they don't have a lot of options. Most of the families are, you know, some are unfortunately being forced to sleep in their cars. Some might have found a temporarily stay with family or friends, but you know, th their situation really hasn't dramatically changed since earlier in the week. They are still homeless. Well, what are the main reasons they're in this situation? Well, to be honest, it really comes down to fixed term leases. You know, um, as we know, we have a rent cap in the city of 5% and that rent cap is tied to tenancy. It's not tied to units. And if, you know, there was a change in that and we, and we tied that rent cap to units, landlords would only be able to increase, you know, rent once a year instead of every time that there's a turnover in tenants. So it, you know, it's a way that landlords are able to circumvent the rent cap, um, but it's, it's increasing the amount of families that we're seeing that are homeless. Well, what kind of stress levels are they operating under right now, these families? You know, I, I, I'm sure we can all imagine it's, it's, it's horrible. I mean, to be a parent, often a single parent, single mom, with multiple children who are in school, who have lives, and having to potentially uproot them from their community, it's, it's m mega stress, coupled with the fact that we're looking at like minus 20 degree temperatures right now. It's, it's, it's the perfect storm. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very stressful time in these families' lives. And, you know, it's, there's not a lot of options out there for them. Well, what has it been like for your staff who are fielding these kinds of calls? Well, it's, <laughs> it's a day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, in the trenches. You know, we're fielding so many calls every day. And, you know, sometimes we can say yes. Um, but, you know, our program is full. The shelter diversion program is full. You know, our housing is full. The shelter, all the shelters in the city are full. So there's not a lot of... There's not a lot of options we can offer these, these families and it is brutal to have to say no and to hear moms crying and, you know, not knowing what to do or having to stay in unsafe or, you know, um, unhealthy environments because they have no other choice. Well, how big a, of a challenge is it to keep families together under these kinds of circumstances? Absolutely, it's difficult. I mean, we're increasingly seeing very large numbers of families. So like sometimes two parents with, you know, four plus children or, you know, a mom and a dad with multiple kids, you know, if there's not space in our program, you know, um, families often have to be split up, you know, dad has to go to a men's shelter, um, mom, you know, there, there aren't really any shelters in the city that accommodate children any, anymore. So she's having to find another alternative, which puts an added stress on families when they're not able to stay as a connected unit. And at one point, does child services get involved? Is that one of the other issues? Absolutely. I mean, if, if a family can't, if parents can't safely house their kids, and you know, a, a call is made to child protection. There is the potential that those kids are apprehended if, if you know, families observe sleeping in a car or kids are in a car or, you know, having to tent. That is a prime case for child protection to become involved. Well, are there any changes you think would, would help people uh, facing these types of situations? Well, as I mentioned before, you know. Um, Having fixed term leases have more stringent rules around them. You know, again, tying leases, having landlords tie leases to units as opposed to tenancies so that they're not able to as quickly turn over, turn over um, tenants, you know, that they're able to have more longevity in their leases. Um, there's other communities in, you know, Atlanta, Canada that are using that model. PEI is a perfect example. Um, and it works. And, you know, it's right now landlords have all the power. And, you know, we are all at the mercy of those fixed term leases. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking us through this. We appreciate your time today. Thank you, Amy.
Coming up with March break travel on the horizon, health officials are urging people to get the measles vaccine. Thousands of mourners turned out for the funeral of Russian opposition politician Alexei Navalny in Moscow today. They gathered under heavy police presence and risked arrest to bid farewell to President Vladimir Putin's fiercest critic. CBC's Briar Stewart has this report. Even this was a simple act of resistance. The Kremlin called Alexei Navalny's funeral unauthorized. But a few thousand turned out in spite of the risk. At times they chanted no war and free Russia. I was dreaming of him to become our president, really. And it's a huge tragedy for me and for my people. Inside the church, a much smaller group. Navalny's parents were there, but his wife and children couldn't be. The risk of them returning and being arrested, like Navalny, was too great. Among the crowd outside, Canada's ambassador to Russia, Sarah Taylor, who described Navalny as a voice of democracy. The Kremlin said Navalny died of natural causes. 
you here believe that. So they demonstrate the, the, to the whole world, we do what we want to do. He was very brave man. Boris Nadezhdin was recently banned from running in the presidential election. But unlike most major opposition figures, he's not in jail or in exile and was able to take part in the service today. Me and Alexei Navalny, we have practically the same understanding of future of Russia. But now its situation is very bad for oppositional activity. A few dozen people were detained and there likely could be more arrests in the days ahead. As Navalny's coffin was lowered into the ground, the song My Way by Frank Sinatra was played, along with the theme from Terminator 2, his favorite film. As the police looked on, the crowd demanded to be let in to say their goodbyes, and eventually officers relented. People streamed in to leave flowers to mourn a man and his dream for a different Russia. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Pressure mounted today on Israel after yesterday's aid convoy deaths in Gaza and accusations the crowd was fired on by Israeli troops. More than 100 people seeking food died. Hundreds more were injured. Germany today demanded Israel investigate. France called for an independent inquiry. And Saudi Arabia, South Africa and Brazil expressed outrage. Israel says the convoy was swarmed and victims were trampled or run over. It does say some shots were fired. UN officials say the incident underlines Gaza is on the brink of famine. The U.S. today said it will begin airdropping aid into Gaza in the coming days. The Gaza catastrophe has another human statistic in the thousands, beside the dead and injured orphans. Right now, it's a story that's heartbreaking, and its impact in the coming years, aid workers say, is impossible to predict. The CBC's Chris Brown reports. There are few moments of fun these days for 12-year-old Alma. An Israeli airstrike in central Gaza in December killed 145 people, including her mother, father, and four siblings. She was the lone survivor. Alma told a videographer working for CBC News, I want to go to my grandmother's, but we didn't because I remind her of what happened to my mom and dad. She adds, I wish I had died with them. Alma is one of 17,000 children that UNICEF estimates have been orphaned or separated from their parents because of the war. Her emotional state is not good, said her uncle. She cries when she remembers her brothers and sisters and her mother and her father. It's hard to calm her down. The creation of so many fractured childhoods and parentless children has emerged as one of the most harrowing humanitarian challenges of the war. And, and we don't UNICEF's Tess Ingram is just back from spending a week near Rafa. What's been happening in the Gaza Strip is, is daily incidences of repeated trauma that children aren't able to flee from. And that sort of impact is something that we don't yet fully understand. Oh. Nine-year-old Yahya is receiving treatment for the wounds he suffered when Israeli bombs destroyed his home two weeks ago. His parents and three older siblings were all killed. I wish I could see my mother's face again, he said. I look on her phone, but there aren't any pictures. I can't see it. He told her videographer he wants to come to Canada, where he has an uncle. But leaving Gaza for anyone right now is very difficult. Dr. Khalil Aldegran has been treating Yaya and countless other children. There's been a huge spread of emotional problems, such as depression, anxiety and isolation, he said. UNICEF says the impact of having so many children losing parents is difficult to know, but the trauma will be long-lasting. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. There is growing concern over an increase in measles cases across parts of the country. The two-month tally is just shy of the dozen cases reported for all of 2023, and it's happening amid worry over global outbreaks just ahead of the busy March break travel season. Lauren Pelly has the latest. 
A warning in Quebec after an unexplained case of measles. We think that it's, it's a beginning of a transmission uh, inside the community. Laval health officials say an unvaccinated individual somehow caught the virus, even though they hadn't traveled. They went on to visit a school, store and two medical sites, all while highly contagious. We are kind of uh, worried uh, about the evolution of measles inside our community. Those fears follow reports of a man in his 30s living north of Toronto who also caught the virus but doesn't know how. The unique thing about this case and, and rather unfortunate thing is that this, this case does not have any uh, travel history or any history of exposure. He had two doses of the measles vaccine and only mild illness. We do know that people who are vaccinated can get a mild form of measles, and, and we think that they're much less likely to transmit it onwards. So that's certainly good news here. There are only a handful of measles cases in Canada right now, but healthcare teams are bracing for more infections as global travel heats up. South of the border, 35 cases in total have been identified across more than a dozen states, including an outbreak in Florida a hotspot for March break vacations. This Montreal pediatric infectious disease specialist says high vaccination rates in Canada should keep the disease at bay, but... There can be certain communities or pockets of areas where the coverage rates are not high enough to stop secondary transmission. Canada's top doctor told us Canadians should make sure their measles vaccinations are up to date. If in, in doubt, I think one dose, getting a, a dose of vaccine prior to travel, uh, would be an important uh, consideration. And multiple experts agreed curbing the spread of measles is crucial, given the risks. It can lead to serious complications, including blindness, brain swelling, pneumonia, even death. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto.
Okay, so it's early for, say, planting flowers or that kind of stuff, but spring is here. Yes. According to you, at least. Meteorological spring <laughs> has arrived, and yes, astronomical spring. If that's uh, more your jam, then uh, that's just 20 days away as well. Not so long. Not long. We're getting there for sure, and the days are getting longer, and we're really going to uh, feel that tomorrow. Uh, and again, I mean, today was a great, nice, bright day, but tomorrow will be as well. Um, and of course, only one week till daylight savings wow. time as well. The longer, longer days. Even longer. So, yes, uh, have a look at uh, first and foremost our current temperatures because I just want to show you where those temps are popping right now up the Great Lakes and Boston's at four on the plus side. That's the milder air that will start to work its way in as early as tonight for Yarmouth, Shelburne, uh, Liverpool, Halifax, uh, and then through the valley, uh, through the wee morning hours of tomorrow, we'll start to see those temps bumping up as that southwest flow with those arrows you can see starting to have more of an influence as we move throughout the day. Tomorrow, note the clouds will be a little bit dominant into the afternoon for the south and west. Uh, but those showers will stay at bay until we move into the later stages of, uh, or at least uh, Saturday evening. Yarmouth, five there, but again, right along the water, three just inland, seven or eight. It uh, will be quite variable uh, in those southwest winds for tomorrow. And again, let's uh, quickly look at Sunday where we do have those showers, uh, but temperatures are staying mm. mild through Sunday. And some double digits. Yeah. All right, well, Ryan, it's not a bird, a plane, or even Superman. It's eight humans taking part in the world's first jet suit race in Dubai. Wow, the event was organized by the company that first launched these special suits in 2017. All eight participants are trained pilots, so Ryan, not something you're going to try at home. Darn. <laughs> the suits are fitted with five gas turbine jet engines. The 1500 horsepower helps launch the wear up into the air and achieve speeds of more than 120 <laughs> kilometers an hour. So cool. Yeah, very, very cool. Well, that's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great weekend. Good night.